Yeah, let me let me know.
hear me okay? What? I don't want to make it seem like I'm yelling at anybody, but uh, people kind of talk loud, so let me go ahead and take the mic just in case. Good evening. Uh, my name is Homer Garcia. I'm the Director of Parks and Recreation Department. I want to welcome everybody here this evening to talk about the Mud Creek Project. Um, I want to introduce, I guess, just a couple of general items, uh, housekeeping. So, um, facilities for the um, Amenities Bio Break right outside this room to the left. Uh, also, there was a sign-in sheet. So, for anybody that uh, wishes to provide comment, um, you should have had that opportunity to um, indicate so. What we're going to do, kind of run a show for this evening. <clears throat> I will turn it over to Councilman Perry to do a few uh, welcome for everybody. Brandon Ross is our uh, trail manager over the program, so he'll provide a presentation. And then we'll go down that list uh, and kind of ask those that signed up to come forward. We'll have this mic here. Uh, we are asking uh, everybody to keep their um, time on the mic to two minutes. Uh, we have Sam over here who, once we get into that portion, will keep track of uh, where we're at so that you know how much time you have. And then if there are any questions that maybe you didn't sign up, but during the course of Brandon's presentation, you think that there's something, oh, I want to go ahead and ask. Uh, you'll have that opportunity. Uh, so, uh, but for anybody who signed up, everybody will have that one opportunity for two minutes. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Councilman Perry. Thank you, Homer. Howdy. Howdy. How are y'all doing this evening? Actually, this is great to see this many people here tonight. This is the kind of engagement that I'd like to see on everything that we do here in District 10. And I want to continue to invite you every third Monday of the month, right here at 7 o'clock. That's our District 10 meetings where we talk about a lot of these types of things, services from the city, nonprofits, every, things that are going on, construction projects all over District 10. And if y'all know, we've had a heck of a lot of those over the last several years. And guess what, we're gonna continue to have those because we do, particularly on the streets, we got so many street projects going and we're gonna continue to have those, especially with this year's um, budget proposal and also this upcoming bond. And so we want to keep everybody in the know on what's going on and keep you informed so that you're not caught high and dry on what uh, is planned by the city to do here in District 10. So uh, this is a project that we've been looking at for several years to expand our trailway system. And I'm not going to get into the details. I'll leave that for Homer and Brandon. But uh, this is something we've looked at for a number of years. And to be perfectly honest, I'm excited about it. I know there's some opposition out there. But that's what this forum is for, is to discuss that, weigh the pros and cons, take comments, and see what we can do to make sure that everybody, well, I hope everybody gets on board, but let me tell you, one thing I've learned early in life is you can't make everybody happy. And we're gonna try, like I'll get out to do that with this project, but again, we're here to discuss your concerns or your what you want to see on this project as well. We've already put, a, and Brandon will go over this, some things that he's already done. Uh, we're not done with this yet. This We're still uh, formulating this project. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Homer, and uh, we'll see what they have to present tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for your leadership and support of our park system. And I, I don't want to uh, steal too much of Brandon's thunder, so we'll turn the mic over to him shortly. But you know, one of the things Councilman uh, talked about, and the great thing about our hike and bike trail system is it connects people to people, people to parks, and communities to each other. And when we think about a growing network of hike and bike trails, we're kind of at this position where, I think two decades ago, it really was about recreation but now it's a point of how can we use it as a uh, mode of transportation. And so um, there, in, in the context of us introducing more than a million people into our community by 2040, clearly there's a need to make sure that we're keeping up with the pace of that growing network. And back to the context of 
park connectivity, equitable access to parks, the hike and bike trail system provides a great way for us to continue to connect people to green space. And we've seen um, more than um, never before, right, the importance of green space as we're still dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, you'll see some of these themes in Brandon's presentation. Again, uh, once he's done, we will then go through those that signed up. If there's somebody that did not sign up, if you raise your hand, uh, I will come find you. And then uh, after everyone's signed up, anybody that would like to have an opportunity to ask a clarifying question or provide comment, again, um, I'll come find you, we'll record your name, then after the initial list of individuals that signed up, um, we'll come to you and you'll be given two minutes just like everyone else. That being said, thank you for being here this evening. Uh, Brandon, the show is yours. You want to put this back? Y'all okay. um, can hear me, right? Back to the back. No. No? No. Some of us are hard of hearing. Okay, all right. Can you hear me now? Is that good? Okay. All right. So um, my name is Brandon Ross. I've been managing the Greenway Trails now for 15 years. And um, I'm going to go through a few uh, preliminary slides. I'm sure most people in here are familiar with the Greenway Trails. I'll just kind of introduce uh, the presentation by saying these are some of the, of the trails that we've built. The one you're looking at now is on Salado Creek Greenway up near what they call the Medicine Wall that's uh, north of Loop 1604. Um, some of the other ones that are scrolling here on, on Leon Creek Greenway. And so we're proud of the work that, that we've been done, that we've done today uh, on this program. Go ahead and get over to the PowerPoint. So back way before I ever started with Parks and Recreation, some of you guys may remember this, but Mayor Pete was uh, councilman for District 9, and then he was mayor, uh, and then uh, back in the late 90s. Um, he and several colleagues of his had kind of heard of this idea, had developed this idea for a Greenway Trail System around San Antonio that would um, preserve land along the creeks and then build recreational facilities along those, those uh, creeks with the hike and bike trail system. And so um, in 2000, that was the year that, that the sales tax was first essentially passed by the voters, okay? It had to go through city council and all that, they put it on the ballot, it was passed by the voters in 2000. And, you know, it, it, now it went, it went through four election cycles, um, 2000, 2005, 2010, 2015. And so through those four cycles, we've collected $190 million and we have built, so far, I'll get to this in a minute, 86 miles of trail, and we're still building out those hike and bike trails. Um, I personally think this is a great project, it's a long time coming. Um, you know, Austin has always been known for this, you know, it's green spaces and the outdoors and everything like this. And I think San Antonio um, was, uh, was wise to invest the money in open space preservation, and develop of these development of these kind of recreational facilities. And so here we are, you know, this many years later, and we've been able to really develop a, a pretty robust system of hike and bike trails, reaching into neighborhoods all over San Antonio. So um, that we're certainly proud of, and that's the legacy that Howard Peak left us. So the primary mission is really just about enhancing quality of life for people in San Antonio. And of course, you know, that can be done in, in multiple ways. The, the main way that we've done it has been through uh, preservation of open space, through development of recreational hike and bike trails, and then trying to connect these pieces together into a connected network for pedestrians and bicyclists and people of other uses. It's any kind of non-motorized use. So, you know, we've seen people on skateboards and on, uh, on you know, roller blades and 
um, people with strollers and all kinds of, of things like this. And then to, um, and then that's pretty much it. I guess preserving open space, recreational opportunities, and building blocks for the pedestrian and bicycle system. So we approach all these kind of the same way in that um, we're trying to build it as durably as possible because all of these are in the floodplain, or I should say about 95% of the greenways are in the floodplain. And so over time, of course, we get flooding. It will create ruts. It will move, the ground moves. You know, the creeks kind of tend to morph and these kind of things. And so, um, and we actually tried other materials other than concrete when we first started the program. Um, and we didn't have too, too good a success. We tried some, what we call uh, cement stabilized base, and then here with Greenway, uh, we also tried asphalt. And there's so much cracking because of all the water penetration to those areas that we started doing concrete. And that was also about the time that asphalt uh, prices started going through the roof because of the oil, uh, the spike in the oil. But anyway, um, that's been the best solution for us. Um, we, we use landscape materials that are native, um, like limestone, boulders, that kind of thing, cedar, that kind of thing. Um, we have to avoid the creek bottom um, unless we just absolutely have no other option um, because of the fact that you know it's a it's a precious environmental resource, and we're also regulated by the Corps of Engineers. So if we do cross the creek, it's usually very perpendicular to the flow, so that we're getting across it just as quickly as possible. Um, we try to preserve everything that we can because, of course, nature is the goose that laid the golden egg on this program. So um, we weave around trees whenever possible. Um, we uh, try to respect any kind of geology, um, caves, natural resources that, of that type. Um, so as far as the user friendliness, uh, we try to make it uh, accessible to all. So that's one of the main tenets, is trying to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, and that means um, making it uh, basically ADA compliant. Um, so it's a 5% running slope and a 2% cross slope on the trails. Um, we provide maps, we provide wayfinding, we provide drinking fountains and bike repair stations and the porta potties and um, uh, mud mitts for the dogs. and. You know, these kinds of things that will be uh, amenities. And we've added over time uh, emergency call boxes. There's another one that we do that um, just started really about maybe four years ago. So we started putting those out. And so we're just trying to kind of learn from our experience, see what kind of products are there, and then just provide whatever we can that makes sense uh, for our trail users and for our park patrons. Uh, we put up flood warnings also, uh, just so that everybody knows when they park in that area, when they start entering the Greenway Trail, that hey, you know, you know what you're getting into here. Um, it could flood, and so if there's a flash flood or a major storm upstream, you know, you have to be aware of those things. And then the connections to neighborhood and other destinations is really super important. Um, the 10 minute walk is something that we're trying to meet more and more and more and more, um, just because. Um, of the, the acts the accessibility um, to people you know we've been able to meet a lot of these goals through this program because of the design and just the way the creeks lay out and using tributaries to reach into neighborhoods and this kind of thing so that especially highly populated areas for instance like the west side creeks um, the people in those is in those neighborhoods also have the opportunity to get to that hike bike trail quickly and then once you're into the hike and bike trail system there are a plethora of parks that you can access using the Greenway Trail System. And then, um, let me see. Yeah, I talked about environmental sustainability a little bit, the tree canopy, geology. Um, the other thing is when we're buying the land, um, you know, a lot of the property that we bought and that's been donated to Parks and Recreation, we've acquired in some way, shape, or form, has been dumped on or it's been like four-wheel drive in there and all kinds of things for years. And so what we do is we try to protect the perimeters of that land so that it's not intruded upon by people who are going to basically abuse it. And then you know, when we build our hiking bike trails, a lot of times we're removing man-made debris and trying to restore it to its natural condition and let, let it um, grow. Now, there have been a lot of instances, too, that we have removed invasive species. Um, 
and but it, it's something that is almost always just kind of a work in progress because they are invasive. You know, ragweed, um, china berry, these things, they just sort of explode all over the creeks. So, you know, that's some, but that's something else that we've tried to um, address. And then we use low impact development tr principles, uh, on especially on our trailheads, uh, where we have parking areas to try to capture the water and treat the water before it enters the system. We have uh, uh, pervious parking spaces in some instances where the, the oil and the pollutants from the cars will get filtered through before it goes into the groundwater and this kind of thing. We have bioswales in other places, things like that. So where we are right now, so uh, we've completed 84 miles of Greenway Trail. Uh, there's 14 miles under construction. There's 15 miles that are uh, either in planning phase or already under design. And to date, um, we've preserved over 1,600 acres of property. And by the way, that does not count the parks, of course, that the trails go through, because the trails go through many, many parks as well. Uh, the 1,600 acres is in addition to the parkland that we have. Um, I would say also that uh, everybody here, of course, is invited to come and celebrate the, the ribbon cutting that we're going to have on November the 6th, on Saturday, for the long-awaited Leon Creek Greenway um, connection that will connect um, Salado to Leon. So Salado Creek Greenway right now is approximately 20 miles. Leon Creek Greenway right now is about 18 miles. We've just substantially completed and technically opened to the public the remaining two miles, and then we're going to celebrate the opening of that with the ribbon cutting on November the 6th. And if any of y'all don't know about that, you want more information about that, most of the people in this room here with Parks and Recreation uh, know about that. So if you see them with this, like, this logo, you can probably ask them about that. But if not, I will be here and can answer questions about that if y'all want one of the 10. But that, that's going to be a really great thing because that's basically going to take all this, this, this 18 miles on Leon plus the 20 on Salado and connect it together to make a big 40 mile one way uh, trail. So that's, that's really exciting and, and we're proud of that. So once the trails are built, then of course we have to maintain them, we have to manage them. Um, we have park police, and by the way, we have um, Officer Ray back here from the Park Police. And, um, and so, you know, if there are any questions about uh, Park Police coverage, sometimes the neighborhoods that are in the areas of the Greenway Trails have questions about security and that. So, thank you for being here. Um, we also have trail stewards that they don't do enforcement like Park Police or like SAPD. But they're on the trails basically to be like a helpful presence to trail users. They do and they can um, report uh, items related to security or related to maintenance and that. But pretty much they're there to be helpful to people. So they give directions. Um, they have uh, bike tire repair kits. They know first aid, this kind of thing. And a lot of times I think it's just giving them maybe a bottle of water or helping um, them find their way if people are lost. Um, that kind of thing. So just kind of watching out for the rest of the trail users. And then we also have a, a trail watch volunteer program, um, which is also very popular. I think we've got like 80 right now, uh, trail watch volunteers. And they do trainings at REI. So if anybody here is interested in being a trail watch volunteer, that's something else that you could ask us about. Um, there is a way for you to volunteer and log hours and be part of that program. Um, also, park operations says basically the the, um, the uh, ladies and gentlemen that come out and maintain our Greenway trails. We have people that do landscape maintenance. We have people who collect trash. We have people who make, who make repairs. It's basically kind of a whole host of um, people that work on trying to keep the Greenway trails looking good. And then stormwater operations, um, they come in about once every five years to do debris removal. So this is basically just to keep the creeks from damming up water uh, and creating problems for adjacent homeowners and businesses. Um, that happens on a rotating cycle about every five years. So um, just kind of bigger context here. The Greenway trails have caught fire in terms of popularity. Um, you know, we've seen more and more uh, listings on realtor.com and things where 
you know, the realtors are, are saying, hey, we've got Greenway access here to this particular listing, you know, that kind of thing. And so and you can see from this billboard, I took this picture um, at one of the apartment complexes that were being built along Leon Creek Greenway. Um, you know, they, they've made it uh, painfully apparent that Greenway Trail access is available for this apartment complex. So anyway, I just I think that's pretty cool that they're proud of this. Um, so in context also the citywide system. So we do have a growing network of Greenway trails, um, but you know the thing that we don't talk about quite as much is, are the natural surface trails. Um, they are also a growing network in the city of San Antonio. We've had 4.4, uh, 4.6 miles recently added. Um, a good example of this is over at what they call Devil's Den, which is near the Ingram Transit Center, uh, Ingram Park Mall, the area near Loop 410 in that area. Um, that was a, a property that is very, very large. It's about 100 acres of property where um, the Parks Department bought the land. It had been very degraded. There was a lot of dumping. Um, there was a lot of uh, concrete and asphalt material that had been dumped there. We came in and spent money to clean that up and block off the perimeters, basically make it to where the four wheeling was not going to be allowed in there any longer. And, um, and now, um, thanks to the help of, of Storm, South Texas Off-Road Mountain Bikers, they have come in and then started building, and they, they built, I don't know how many miles, but I, right in a particular location, they built a, net, a network of natural surface trails in there. And we work with them on a regular basis to identify other places throughout town where if we acquire the land and we have the space to build natural surface trails. Part of that is, of course, it's great recreation. Part of it, too, is that it takes a little bit of pressure off of the Greenway if there are other trails that people can use beside just the Greenway. So, and we do have places that do have um, traffic on the Greenway, basically. Um, we're trying to kind of see how we can even regulate that in the future, possibly building a side trail or expanding the width of the trail and that kind of thing. Like on Leon North, for instance, it's very crowded. Um, it's a very popular place. It's like the Bolero Trailhead there at Loop 16 of 410 is kind of the center of the universe when it comes to Greenway Trail use, but now the one at, at uh, Salado, 1604 is also really popular. So we're trying to just, you know, continue building trails and trying to make them as as um, accommodating as possible for people uh, who are entering our system. And so, you know, like I've said, we're, we're expanding the land that we own. We're continuing to, to buy and preserve open space. We're continuing to expand our greenways. And we're also continuing to expand the natural surface trails. So in District 10, um, District 10 has a, the highest number of natural surface trails of any of the council districts in San Antonio. Um, and then they also have um, the lowest number of Greenway trails in the city of San Antonio at 4.8 miles of trail. Um, some of the highest concentrations of Greenway trails are really um, kind of on the northwest side of town. Um, district 8, there's a lot of trails in District 8, there's some in District 9. There's quite a lot in District 3 because of the Medina River Greenway and District 4. Uh, and there's now a growing number in Districts 5, District 1, and 7, which are kind of on the, on the west side because of the development of the west side creeks. And so, you know, we're trying to um, serve the entire city and uh, make it as equitable as possible, especially for highly, highly populated areas like the west side. Um, but I uh, just wanted to point this out. We're going to be uh, continuing to build trails all over the city and also in District 10. And McAllister Park, so start to kind of talk now about the area where Mud Creek Greenway is going to be. And I know most people are probably here to hear to talk about Mud Creek Greenway, but of course, if you have any questions about the whole system, you can certainly accommodate that too. So 77% of the of the trails within McAllister Park are currently natural surface trails. Uh, and then that gets me to the, the proposed Greenway route. Um, so this this Greenway Trail is essentially one that the what's under design currently is, is this 1.6 miles from the dog park to Thousand Oaks. 
So um, it's a little bit misleading just in the fact that it's not like we're going to go to construction tomorrow with this piece. There is a bigger plan actually to go under Thousand Oaks and go to Bulberry Road. That piece uh, from Thousand Oaks to Bulberry Road is not under design yet, but that will be one that, he, that is going to be in design in the future. And then the plan is to ultimately take it farther, like up to Loop 1604, even beyond Loop 1604. And I can get into that in just a minute too. So 10-foot um, wide concrete hiking bike trail, similar to our other ones. Um, the design is about 80% complete on this. Uh, and the, like I mentioned a minute ago, we're looking to, to uh, connect in the future going north of Thousand Oaks, going north of Bulberti Road, and all the way to Loop 1604 and beyond. So the, the way this is, is going to happen is this particular piece, like I said, is in design. When the, the, the money is, has been committed by Bear County to build uh, this section of hike and bike trail, but it's not, it's not on their plan until 2026. So the money will not become available for the continued design, which would go from Thousand Oaks to Fulberry Road, and then the construction of the whole four miles all the way from the dog park to Fulberry Road until 2026. And so that's what we're looking at is, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do what we can to finish the design here at some point in the future, but then we're gonna be, there's gonna be a bit of a waiting game to get that next uh, piece of funding that will allow us to finish the design and move forward with the construction. And by the way, um, I've had conversations with some of the people in the neighborhood here at Hunter's Mill, and um, they're excited about getting a connection into their park. And so, you know, that those are gonna be ongoing discussions about how that looks and, and, uh, and, and how we're gonna make the connection there. So the Mud Creek Greenway just kind of a little bit drilling into some of the of the details here. So Bee Tree Road, I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. It's east of uh, Buckhorn. Uh, Bee Tree Road, it's actually down. You can see a picture on the lower left. Um, has been one that's been basically unused for a while. Um, what we would do there is uh, build the hike and bike trail pretty much in the middle of the road, and then reclaim all the asphalt to the sides of it. Uh, by replanting it, and we may be able to have room to do some tree plantings along there as well. So that's one one space um, that would be built. Um, the other it would go, go back to the map. It would circle um, from Bee Tree Road, basically uh, be sort of next to uh, and in between uh, two soccer fields. There's a lower soccer field area, Bee Tree, and there's an upper Bee Field area. It would go between those essentially, and then go along um, part of the the green loop that goes through this area. And you can see kind of on this map the route there in in green, but then there's also all the natural surface. There's kind of this web of network of, of natural surface trails here in brown, and then we would connect with Hunter's Mill here. So you can see there's a couple of pictures here of the the green loop and then there's this uh, picture of Bee Tree Road. So one of the things when we first started talking with um, Friends of McAllister Park, and this has been about two years ago, was the uh, desire to offset any of the trail construction with other like natural space. So um, I've had several conversations with John Charles and some of Laura and this and Laura, Laura Matthews. Um, the message that we got was, you know, the plan that was developed for McAllister Park was not to uh, add any new development. And I believe that was that was written in response to the proposal at the time for Capital Little League to come in and clear cut, you know, large swaths of the park. That was a rejected idea, um, but the point being that, you know, they didn't want any new development. So if that applies to Greenways, then what, you know, what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to offset the two acres approximately of what would be built within McAllister Park by trying to reclaim other areas that have been degraded, that have been, that have um, uh, impervious cover, that have been developed, so to speak. So 
what we're, what, the way that we get there is partially through reclamation of some of the land there at Bay Tree Road, but then most of it will probably be here. Um, this area at Upper B, at the Upper B Fields, um, if y'all know this area, that where you where you drive in here, there's uh, an asphalt road that goes around, and then there's sort of just this haphazard network of, of roads um, that are kind of just not very well thought out. They're kind of everywhere. And there's a lot of impervious cover here. Um, what we would do is then try to sort of um, compact this the parking area to a low impact development parking area that would be pervious, that would allow the water to filtrate and that, and then we would reforest um, probably the rest of it, which would probably be something like um, two acres, like an acre and a half, two acres. Um, I had, had a conversation with um, the president of NASO, the uh, Northeast um, Soccer Organization, and um, they're supportive of this, but we're gonna have to work with them on the design and make sure that they've got enough uh, space for people to park. I don't think it's gonna be a problem. Right now, it's a sprawling parking slash roadway area that I think we can we can provide enough parking for the soccer fields and um, possibly some more parking for trail users and park users and still get space to be able to reclaim with that reforestation. Um, so one of the other things that I know is on everybody's mind is this question about the CPS easement. The CPS easement is one of three routes that, that we Parks and Recreation originally looked at as options. When we go into anything, what we're doing is trying to find the best route that makes the most sense, that gives us the biggest bang for the buck, that's the best you know, for, for everybody involved. Permitting-wise, obviously, environmentally, for the stakeholders who are in the area, for the neighbors who are in the area, for the trail users citywide. So, um, there were some issues that, that have been found that we want to kind of go over here with the CPS easement. Um, this is one that um, is, first of all, safety is, is, is one of the biggest concerns. The Parks and Recreation Department, as a practice, we just don't want to put pedestrians and bicyclists and vehicles, uh, cars and trucks, in the same space unless there are other options. And so to go along the CPS easement route would require three residential street crossings. Um, let's see, two of which would be through like, there's Stony Creek, I think is the, are some of the names of the street, they all start with like Stony. So those would be two crossings there of streets where people would have to contend with uh, cars and trucks. There's another one um, in the Hunters Mill neighborhood, I think it's Row uh, within the Hunters Mill neighborhood. And so the thing, those are ones that we want to avoid if there's other options because of, of that safety concern. And if anybody knows about you know Vision Zero, that's kind of plays plays into the narrative of Vision Zero because there have been so many accidents over the years with um, bicyclists getting hit by cars and, and that kind of thing. Um, the other is uh, the location of the trail improvements related to this gated community. Um, the streets, like I mentioned a minute ago, like Stony Creek, Stony Ridge, and whatnot, um, it's a gated community. Uh, we would, to build the Greenway Trail along the CPS easement, uh, this particular picture here in the middle kind of demonstrates what we would be dealing with. This is where we would have to cross. We would have to be crossing that street behind their entrance uh, sign and then we would have to probably be relocating this gate so that when cars come up to the gate, it's not like a, a situation where automatically, you know, the cars that are queued up to get in the gate are gonna be in the way of the path that people potentially on their bikes and uh, walking would then be potentially in the path of the cars, that kind of thing. The other is the, the fencing, the security fencing that's around that neighborhood because we would essentially be penetrating the neighborhood with the hike and bike trail, we would have to then um, pay for security fencing for large sections of the neighborhood that don't currently have security fencing. So that's another one. And so I'll, a couple other things here. There are, uh, of course, the city of San Antonio Parks Department owns McAllister Park, and so there are no land acquisitions required 
with that at Sparks Space on both sides of the Hyde Park Trail. Um, it's built in the CPS easement. There is a privately owned tract of land, and then there are two, two tracts of land that are owned by the Hunters Mill Homeowners Association that we would have to, to essentially buy or um, somehow acquire. There's also a significant elevation change of uh, approximately 20%, which would, you know, if we built the, the path at grade, of course it would be inaccessible, like I mentioned a minute ago, uh, to meet accessibility criteria. It has to be 5% or less. And so 20% will not uh, permit that. Um, the other thing, I mean, what we do, and by the way, I wanted to just address this as well. Um, there's been some, I know, media posts and things of this nature saying, well, look at the Leon Creek Greenway over near Eisenhower Park. That's what uh, Mud Creek uh, Park or McAllister Park will end up looking like because what we had to do in that case, it's so very steep. And if anybody knows that area, there's a CPS easement through there. And these high lines come through like this because it's such a steep area. So to make that grade is why we had to make that cut. We created a retaining wall there that would be as steep as possible so that we're not having to cut into the land and then, and then feather it out like this. We try to be as efficient as possible to, to lose as few trees as possible. And if there was a route there that had no trees in whatsoever, we would have taken that route. Um, but this is a completely different scenario. Right here, we would have definitely have a problem because of the 20% slope. The only way that we could build this would be to either fill this, this drainage easement like this to make the slope work, or else to cut back the other direction, um, which of course would undermine this tower that's here. So that 20% slope is kind of a deal killer in itself. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and, and these towers, of course, are huge. Um, there is some kind of uh, either gang trail or somebody's trail going right through the middle of this one, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, the privacy. So we try also to balance, you know, I mentioned a minute ago, we, we don't like to be in the creek bottom for environmental reasons. We also don't like to be right in people's backyards because of, of the respect that we try to have for adjacent residences so that we're, we're respecting people's private property and that they're not out you know trying to enjoy sitting on the back patio you know in the evening and having people you know making noise and, and all of this kind of thing and so we try to stay away from the backyards as much as possible um, there are some places around town where we really have to kind of strike a, uh, a delicate balance between the bottom of the creek and these backyards that may be here so we try to find kind of a little terrace maybe in between um, and if we take the CPS easement, um, that's another one where, you know, if the, the thing is only about 90 feet wide, and so we put the trail in there, we're going to be looking at, at the very best, 40 feet between the hike and bike trail and the backyards that are adjacent. Um, the alignment that, that I showed you a minute ago on the Mud Creek route here, um, it, there is no place along this route that gets any closer to 80 feet. From the, from the back fence lines of the homes. And in most cases, it's more like 100 to 200 feet away. And so that's kind of another advantage. Um, and then, of course, the, the beauty of Mud Creek, um, the beauty of McAllister Park, I mean, this is a great place for trails. And of course, it's a great place for natural surface trails. Um, but, you know, there are gonna be a lot of people visiting here, visiting the greenways who may not um, be able to use the natural surface trails for accessibility reasons and other things. And there may be people who are new to the system. And so, you know, we're hopefully inviting uh, people of, of all sizes, shapes, and abilities to enjoy the Greenway trails. And this is a beautiful space that has a lot of shade. It's got aesthetic appeal. Um, and like I mentioned about the backyards. And the other, the other piece is, Homeless encampments have, have, have grown in recent years. Um, the Greenway trails also act as a deterrent for uh, homeless encampments because of the use. Of course, you know, it just makes sense. If you're out camping, if you're you know, trying to kind of have your domicile out in the woods, 
Um, if you've got people coming in all the time and you know they're riding their bicycles and they've got their children and all this kind of stuff, it's just not really one of those kind of compatible uses. You probably look for somewhere else to go. And so you know that's something else. By the way, um, I would say we're working with Storm already on another project where we want to invite both the Greenway and Natural Surface Trails to be built. This is along Bio Creek so that um, we're able to keep eyes and ears on some of these other places um, where homeless encampments hopefully will not spring up. We hopefully do not have uh, people you know, in there um, leaving trash and debris and beer cans and you know, hazardous materials um, in the, the parkland, in the open space, in the, the uh, tree canopy areas that we own. Um, yeah, so get to the next one here. So I just wanted to also talk about the big picture. The big picture is continued expansion of uh, open space, continued expansion of our Greenway Trail system, continued expansion of, of uh, natural surface trails around the city. This is, this is the, the four miles I mentioned a minute ago. This would be the project that would be funded by Bear County in 2026, and then we would finish the design going to Valverde Road, and we would build this section first. But when I say first, what I mean is, we absolutely believe that north, northward on Mud Creek is a good option for future Greenway trails, and then even beyond. There is a plan currently uh, taking shape right now called Great Springs Project. Uh, if any of you have not heard of that, it's a, uh, a conceptual plan at this point that would um, link Austin to uh, San Marcos, to New Braunfels, to San Antonio, all with a regional Greenway Trail system. And so we're kind of starting to have discussions with them now. Um, they've gotten sponsorships, they've gotten support, they're starting to get you know, more and more uh, momentum toward trying to make that happen. And it's very, very likely that this would be the route to which, you know, many people would be coming into San Antonio from other places, um, you know, not only in these neighborhoods but northward, but specifically talking about these neighborhoods, just this four miles um, would be providing uh, uh, that 10 minute walk uh, goal to approximately 1,970 new residents, and so that, sorry, actually residential homes, and so, you know, times however many persons per household, two point something, and it's quite a lot of people that would then have walkable, bikeable access to the Greenway Trail System, uh, the Salado Creek Greenway Trail System, to McAllister Park, and of course a, a, a host of other parks that are on the Salado Creek Greenway Trail System. Excuse um, me. Yeah. You're talking about the 1,970 new residents. Are they building new developments, or are these people moving? Where, where this is from? this is basically from from uh, from both both sides here, all the way up to Redland Road, where we got the the trail here. So all these people here, we would be working with to try to make neighborhood connections. Um, they may be the natural surface connection. A lot of the backyards are actually directly adjacent to the Greenway Trail. What we've found in other locations is that where we built a trail like this, and there are backyards that are kind of set along like this, that people often build a gate for themselves, so they just have like a natural surface little connection like this. But when we're working with Palmer's associations, uh, a lot of times it's a more like a, a more formal kind of a connection with a, a concrete trail that goes into like an open space that's owned by the neighborhood or something like this. Um, anyway, so, so this kind of gives you an idea of the connectivity that we'll have for Fall Creek Homeowners Association, Green Valley, Hunters Mill, and some of the others. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of point out, you know, we, we've had a lot of success working with stakeholders and neighborhood groups, and you know, that's what this meeting is for. I'm sure we'll continue having conversations about this in the future. I've already engaged with Hunters Mill and trying to engage more and more. I've reached out to the property manager with Fall Creek and Green Spring Valley. Um, so, you know, we, we're proud of the fact that we, we work cooperatively with neighborhoods. Um, here's a couple of quotes. Uh, Parks and Recreation uh, staff took great care in thoughtfully responding to residents' questions and concerns. 
The trail project was built with great sensitivity to the natural environment as well as the surrounding neighbors. Um, I'm sure that you wouldn't mind me telling you this. Um, that was Chuck Saxer who said that. Um, that was um, after several years uh, after the first Greenway Trail had ever been built in San Antonio. That was the piece that went from Hardberger, what is now Hardberger Park, what was Velcro Park at the time, up to Hebner Road. That two miles was uh, very interesting because we had a lot of skeptics in the neighborhood. They didn't know what a Greenway Trail was. They had no idea why 10 feet uh, made any sense. They were like, we're gonna build this highway. It's gonna be right behind these houses. You know, we were able to basically, through a lot of conversation and meetings, um, convince them that yes, you know, this is kind of the only option that we have to make this link. And by the way, I think you'll love it at the end of the day. And sure enough, um, it's become extremely popular with those neighbors. And, um, you know, Chuck has been very happy about it. Uh, the neighborhood leaders are very happy about it. You know, um, and like I said a minute ago, we've got now a lot of people who were originally naysayers that have gates straight from the backyards into Greenways. By the way, without blocks on them. So proud of that fact. Uh, thanks for Park Police and, and all the trail users. You know, we've got the Park Police, we've got the trail stewards, but I'll tell you the greatest security is just having all the eyes and ears of people who ride the Greenways. You know, because if you're a criminal, you don't want to be seen by a lot of people. You don't want a bunch of witnesses. So if we have hiking bikers using that trail system, it just helps with the security of the system. So anyway, thanks you guys for using the trails. Um, and then here's another one. Um, this is from the Inwood neighborhood. Um, we worked with them to create a connection and, um, and work through all of their concerns because they, of course, are uh, a neighborhood who does have a secured entrance. They were very particular about that and we were able to work through that with them. Okay, so now I've got at least a good start here on the questions and comments. So I'll start reading off names. And I'm going to put this microphone here in the middle of the room, and I'm going to do my best. I know there's people who might not be able to hear me respond, but instead of uh, you know passing the mic back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, we're still in kind of a COVID-19 deal here. So I'm going to put the mic over here and um, let you guys come up to the microphone and uh, ask a question, or if it's a comment, maybe I don't need to respond. But I'm going to put this here, and I'm going to start kind of reading down the list. Actually. Give me just a minute and I'll keep the list.
far from much of what Fred said. Um, I support an alternate route, and I want to address why. It doesn't flood. People will have at more access to the Greenway, as Brandon explained. People want the Greenway behind their house, most people. Why would it be different than here? And as far as um, as far as power lines, much of the Greenway are under the power lines. If you don't believe me, ride along and look up. It doesn't cause a problem. Um, the gated community, going through the gated community, one of those gates can be moved. The gated community area that is behind those gates, most of it is not owned by that community. It's owned by CPS. Um, the street crossings in the neighborhood, very, very little, little traffic. <laughs> They are not through the streets. The trail grade. I have tried numerous times to have people come out and tour that area with me. I have an alternate way to get around that last power line tower. I realize the problems with that. I would like for somebody to take the time to actually go with me and look at it.
Alex and Dave Mann for the opportunity to be here today. I know a lot of us, for the first time, um, we're hearing this information. Um, I think many of us didn't really get all the facts or all the information up front, so this is a really great meeting to get all of the information out there and get any misleading or misinformation that may have been put out kind of out of the way. Um, so we're going to take some time to kind of sit with this and see how, you know, whether this is now you're on the fence or you're still where you were at. This is a good time to take this information, really sit with it, and think about what's coming through. I'm going to say, I'm a cyclist. I enjoy mountain biking. That's my <laughs> main form of recreation. Um, but I also enjoy the paved trails. And I want to say that this year, more than any other year, I use the paved trails because it has been too wet to ride the dirt trail. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate them. I just want to make sure that they're there for later. So I'm staying off the dirt trails and riding greenways. Um, and one great thing that we witnessed at Devil's Den, which was some of those dirt trail pictures that were up, was that people were using the greenways, but they didn't really know the dirt trails were there. Um, after the pandemic, it was really great because people started discovering the dirt trails. Paved trails and greenways are an entry point to other parts of nature. So bringing in those residents and connecting them and giving them the opportunity to enjoy the dirt trails as well. Storm will be able to reroute the trails. They will be MTB optimized. <laughs> they will be the same distance, if not more. And we will be able to reduce the wet of trails that are out there at this time. The paved greenway will, will help with that. Um, it'll also bring some stability that we can leverage for the dirt trails. Um, all right, well, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay. My name is Sharon Neeson, and I actually happen to have a home that is along the proposed section, the red line in the images. Um, my concern really is right now, the safety is a huge issue. But the thing that we need to kind of remember is that. Just because we are connected by con excuse me, concrete does not mean that we are connected to nature. We need to maintain our trails. They're absolutely gorgeous trails, but we need to stop thinking that humans need to take away from Mother Nature and that we have to have concrete in order to go out and have a great time. I take my 81-year-old father out on the trails because they are good for his joints. He cannot walk on concrete. The thought that we're potentially replacing all of our all of our beautiful trails with concrete, it just breaks my heart. How many animals do we have to displace is my question. When is enough enough? Granted, I love the fact that we're trying to connect all these trails, all these cities and what have you, but when is enough enough? Um, the other thing too is that we have to take into account is that our mayor made a commitment back in 2017 to support the Paris, Agre Paris Agreement. And we would do everything in our power to not increase the temperature within our city. This goes completely against what our mayor promised. And this also goes against the 2019 CAAP ordinance, which also makes sure that we do our utmost to not increase the temperature within our city. Concrete in the summertime in, in, excuse me, in San Antonio is not walkable. People would be going onto the dirt. They already do it today. I'm guilty of doing it myself. Thank you very much.
My name is Sherry Dugas, and if you can't tell by my mask, I ride bikes. I'm also the District 10 representative to the Linear Creek Commission. Um, I'm in favor of this extension. There are several reasons why. Uh, I'm an older person, and I still like to ride bikes, and I'm looking at the long-range connectivity that Councilman Perry is proposing to bring it all the way up to Mulberry and Redmond Road. Right now, we ride from McAllister to Eisenhower, which is 16 miles one way. We ride it two times a week. But in order to get from my house, which is next to my creek, to McAllister Park, I do not ride down Jones Maltzberger. I don't trust the drivers on Jones Maltzberger, so I have to put my bikes in my car, in my truck, and ride down there. The long range connectivity of having this trail would mean that I would be able to ride into McAllister Park without having to ride down Jones Maltzberger. And it's much more shady along the proposed trail than it would be to go under the CPS easement. And one last thing, um, Mayor Peak talked about the emerald necklace that will circle San Antonio with the trails. This one particular piece would be a spoke or connectivity into the necklace. So ladies, imagine you have an emerald nexus right here, and we have spokes down here. This spoke will be made out of diamonds that were more expensive than the emeralds. So now we have a diamond spoke instead of just part of the emerald necklace. Thank you very much. shots, so I think I can speak safely without mass. Two points, one uh, of immediate application to this project. I would hope that the design review goes back and sort of re-looks at the entire Salado Creek Trail configuration. Uh, I live over near MacArthur High School, and we have this great Salado Creek Trail going by, and it connects with a trailhead at Lady Bird Johnson Park, which is on the wrong side of Nacogdoches Road from all the neighborhoods. So, you know, if kids want to go out and go to the park, they got to go across Nacogdoches. God help them. Okay? So, neighborhood access needs to be considered. Is there really neighborhood access to all these people you say you're going to give access to? Okay? Don't put a busy road in between the neighborhood and the track. That's number one. Number two, number two, all you folks that have got some kind of tip about concrete, you need to get with the parks department and figure out some kind of compromise solution, okay? We're part of Friends of Comanche Lookout. They recently replaced a lot of natural surface with concrete trails, okay? Our older park patrons love the concrete because now they can get around on trails that they were limited, had limited access to before. Okay? We still got about a third of the park that does not have concrete, and our older park patrons don't use those trails, okay? Because they stumble, there's bad footing, okay? It's it, it's muddy, it, it's a mess. So if you, can have, if you can have permeable parking lots, why can't you have permeable trails? Okay? That's all I got. So I'm just going to address that because you asked the question. Okay? But thank you. Um, so the reason that we're, we're proposing to do concrete here and not a permeable surface like decomposed granite or like some kind of other pervious type of like a, a gravel or a base material, limestone base material, this is because of the flooding. Um, the flooding will destroy those surfaces we found. And so, again, I mean, we would have to be rebuilding it um, potentially annually, biannually, um, in order to keep it sustainable over time where it, it wouldn't, you know, and by the way, we, we've tried to compost granite, by the way, it's in the floodplain, there's a major lookout, this is not the floodplain, that's not a good reason. The, the water has everything to do with it, you know, I mean, you know, we tried actually in Harburger Park, there was a trail that we built, at first we built it out of decomposed granite, because we wanted to be natural, by the way, I love natural trails, if we could build that out of something that would and it would be accessible in the future, then you know that would be wonderful. The issue is the practical nature of the fact that nothing else will stay except for you know asphalt, which we don't use asphalt because we 
out very quickly and then was basically scattered over a large area. And then, you know, we, we ended up replacing that with the property because we didn't want to go just feeding that uh, drainage area with decomposed granite time and time and time again because it would just be all this material that would end up in the creek. So anyway, I just wanted to address that. Let me go to the next person, Trent Trunks. What was the last person's last name? Uh, Eason. Okay. That was me. <laughs> yeah, that's Michael Eason. <laughs> I'll wait for the next one. Okay. Uh, I'm okay. sure we probably don't have two Michael Eason's here, but you're welcome to come up and speak. Well, I'll wait for the next one. I'm just making sure. It's Anderson. His last name is Anderson. Anderson. Oh, Anderson. Okay. Then I'll, I'll get to him in just a second. No. Okay. Thank you. Michael Anderson. Okay. So Michael Anderson is on. So Mr. Eason. Oh, she can go. I'll, I'll wait for his turn. Okay. Um, uh, so, my name is not Michael Anderson, it's Michael Eason. Um, I'm a botanist, uh, ecologist. I do native plant landscape and design. Um, those last two aspects are one of the reasons why I often get called as a consultant to come look at city parks and municipal parks and basically see what's wrong with them. And so in my time at McAllister Park, one of the first things I saw was what I call an urban forest, which is a for this feral, um, unmaintained forest that's allowed um, natives, and in some cases non-natives, to take, take sort of root there. And so the whole system down there is a little bit changed. It's not really a, a pristine site, but it is a very nice 100-acre uh, little tract of land that you all have here. Um, so the second thing I noticed were erosion issues that were going on there. And then this is when Marjeska and I we started getting involved in this. And we started looking at all the issues that are going on here. And I, one of the things I mentioned was using these uh, natural pathways. Are you writing stuff down? I'm just writing her name. Okay, so we all listen to you. So. Would you mind going to the microphone so we can hear you? Yeah. Thank you. So there's a couple things that that you were saying when you were up here talking. And, and I, I look, listen to people's words. You used a lot of qualifiers when you talked about um, putting the pathway through the power library. You said, maybe, probably, I don't think this would happen. But then, when you talked about the absolutes of using concrete, those words were really quite different. So it's as if you all have already made up your mind. Is that true? Uh, yes. So. The reason all of this input is futile. Well, I, I mean, we can have a discussion about it. I'm here to answer questions. But the CPS easement is not a buildable trail uh, option. No, but it, it actually is. Okay, well, I, I tried to use non qualified words to. So it, actually, it actually is a, a feasible route. You can use, you can use gravel. No, Jeff, Jeff went over. You can use gravel. <laughs> You can use permeable material, uh, and there are so many other ways you can go about this and not put concrete along a natural path in a natural system. So there are there are options. Miles, miles, accessible outdoor trails 
uh, and many of our city's greatest outdoor and natural spaces. Uh, the Greenway system is not just for cyclists. It's a benefit to somebody like myself who has different mobility needs. It's a benefit to the elderly and aging population who want to be able to walk out towards safely. It's a benefit to families and single moms who want to go outside and push strollers and enjoy the outdoors with their kids. I'm really proud of the way our parks department has thoughtfully and sensitively designed a trail system that is both universally accessible and sensitive to the natural environment. I say all of this because if you take a look at the map of McAllister Park and add up the entire length of all the trails in McAllister Park, only 23% of them are accessible. That's less than a quarter. And if you look at the area of the Mud Creek Trail, that number drops to zero. So all of you who love the Mud Creek Trails, tell me all about it because I can't get there. I believe that any trail that just simply follows some power lines and isn't truly accessible, and I'm sorry, a 20% grade is not a feasibly accessible trail isn't in line with the vision for our Greenway system can and should be. And I, I, I believe that adding the Mud Creek Greenway trail system will be opening up more of our park to a wider variety of users. And I believe that if we take the stance that we're going to put no more paved trails in our park, then we're just shutting people out of those parks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm building, yes, I'm for it. There is no hesitation about it. I mean, what, what we have with Green Springs and a possible connection up north, I, I want to go with Brandon and ask for one big one and Mr. Perry, which will probably be way up there. Could we make this McAllister North Park entrance in the future? If, you know, we'll have trails, we're going to gain everything. Uh, the shade issue is not a big deal. The, the trail does not. Uh, take away from the greenery. I mean, we all love it, and I'm all for it. So build it, we'll come. David and Leslie Jernigan. You answer my question. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's finish. Um, March Estimate. shift to our highest levels of gratitude 
for what the land has given us and reciprocity in giving back to it as stewards. I'm hoping for a win-win where we create connectivity and protect our natural areas and restore them. The Friends of McAllister Park has recommended the alternate route in the power line. Uh, the benefits of the power line route are that it is not in a floodplain. And Brandon has said that you, they can't do concrete for the Mud Creek Greenway because it's in a floodplain. Well, the power line route is relatively flat and could be built with uh, imper impermeable surfaces. Um, the 20% grade that he has talked about could be worked around, like Laura Matthews said. She, thank you. I just want to say one thing. We can't just define ourselves by what we build, but we also need to, but by what we refuse to destroy. Thank you. Barbara Brown. Hello, my name is Barbara Brown. I'm a member of the Friends of Mac College for Park, and I do not support the Greenway through Mud Creek. I do support the alternative route. Um, I heard the city may, uh, say many reasons that it would not work the alternative route. I think that if they put their minds to it, I did not hear anything that they could not overcome if they put their minds to it. Um, what I did not hear them say is any concern about saving the last natural environment that we have in that area and I would request that they put more effort into that. Thank you. Good evening, good evening everybody. Thank you Councilman Perry, Brandon, Homer, Officer Ortiz. Thank you so much for putting this on. We really appreciate it. My name is David Demperot. I grew up in District 9. I'm a cyclist avid trail user both on and off the road and I am very much in favor of this Mud Creek Greenway. I grew up going to McAllister Park before the Greenway was able to get there to get me there. I would drive there with my family every time we used it. That is what is causing our city's climate goals. That's what we need to address with our climate adaptation impact. Now I can bike there from my parents' house, but the people who are living north of Jones Mulsburger can't do that same thing. As you said, it's just not safe. But Smug Creek Greenway is about connectivity and accessibility, it's about safety, and as Trent said earlier, building a route under a power line so that that's the only way to, to put, only place to put an accessible trail is not an accessible trail. That means you are putting aside some people to an area that's inhospitable and others get to enjoy the one that is. If you love a place, and I do love McAllister Park, I grew up going to it, and I know we need to find the money to do exactly what Mark Jessica was saying and build in those native plantings to make the soil stay intact. That is a worthy goal and I want to make that happen. If we love a place, we want to let everybody into it. If you love McAllister Park, and so many of you do, you should invite everybody in, especially those who can't use it right now. Thank you all. Solely, and it's kind of funny, uh, five years ago, it's really not funny, but uh, exactly five years ago, we were in a similar meeting discussing with the city when they were going to give our land away to Capital League, Little League, they were going to put baseball fields in the Gallister Park, and I fought it and I raised hell, and there were many people that didn't like it, and in the end, they didn't do it, and my goal is to not see it happen here again. You show these pictures of Mud Creek that were beautiful, scenic, shaded, and you talk about preserving green space. And how do you want to preserve the green space? By tearing it up and putting concrete in. I understand everyone wants to have everyone be inclusive, and that's fine, but at what cost? You keep putting in pavement all over the park. My uh, in-laws, they're in their 80s. They love that place. They can go there, it's peaceful, it's quiet, the pave. If you go on any of these paved right now, it's crazy. There's people everywhere. I like Mud Creek. I know so many people that love that part of the park. It's peaceful, it's quiet, wildlife everywhere. 
What's going to happen? You want everyone to enjoy this peaceful place. It's not going to be peaceful once you rip out 15 feet wide of trail and trees and plow through it so it can be accessible to everybody. And then there goes all the charm. And then we just have another concrete trail that leads to somewhere else. Leave the nature alone. Leave the park alone. I will, I'm going to make sure that I do whatever I can for a public outcry because I just don't think it's right. So that's my opinion. That's how I feel about it. And I want to save Mud Creek and keep it unpaid and natural as it sits. Park for the last almost 27 years, and I absolutely love it. I wish I could take my sleeping bag and sleep out there. <laughs> but what concerns me is that I also live in the gated community. And y'all may not know, but that's 35 acres of land that back in the early 80s at our great city of San Antonio decided, make it private. Why? Why make an area private next to a park beyond me? Ever since then, our 201 owners, we are the orphan child of San Antonio. We have to pay for our streets. We have to pay for our night lighting. We have to beg the city to come out of those every five years to do the dredging. We have a city a two-mile canal through our subdivision that's been nothing but a pain. I believe in Laura Matthews. I believe in Morjeska. I believe in the park. But I also believe in private property. If y'all take down the gate that's at Stony Square, that opens us up for the public again. Oh, gee, May, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that we will revert back to 20 years ago because we live next to the park. Great place to park. Can't tell you. I have a good friend named Herda, German. We have been out at 2 and 3 in the morning chasing people out of our subdivision. Some of them were gang members. It's gotten a lot better. I don't know which way this is going to go. I, I wish y'all the best, but the city has got to consider you remove our gates and we're back with the public. Thank you. Pat Mays. Could you, could you put up the map of the um, proposed? My name is Pat Mays. I'm on the board of directors uh, with May Ashton, which with Stone Nine. I'm going to go back to that one. And where we live.
Let me just very quickly um, kind of mention something here. The reason that we're not closer down here is because of the flow of the water and because of the, um, the, the washout, because of the erosion, and because of, of the, uh, the ge geology and the, uh, basically the, the uh, dynamics of the floodplain and the creek. So, you know, this area is very low, um, it's more sensitive, and would probably cause more environmental damage and the trail would be uh, underwater. So the other thing I wanted to also just point out here, in case anybody doesn't know where the CPS easement is, this is in here, um, and this is what was basically proposed as an alternate, is to go um, through here. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, um, next is, um, let's see, De Deborah Talsey. Taylor, excuse me, Taylor, Deborah Taylor. Okay, how about uh, Victor Basil? Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Vic Basil. I live in Hunters Mill subdivision and uh, I knew this was coming for a while, but uh, the, the, the plans, the details of the plans uh, are something new uh, to me. Uh, but I use the, the trails all the time. I love riding the Greenway trails. Uh, but seeing the plan there uh, about going through a neighborhood was a little shocking. That, uh, that, that neighborhood is, is right in Stone Ridge. I'm not exactly sure why you wouldn't stay in the park instead of going through a neighborhood. But then also, you mentioned that there was gonna be a connection in Hunter's Mill, and I would really like to know a lot more about that because we already get, we have a park in Hunter's Mill right next to Thousand Oaks. We already get enough outside uh, traffic coming into our neighborhood from outside to use the park. And if there's going to be some type of connection where you access that trail at Hunter's Mill, I'd, I'd really like to know a lot more about that. And we're going to have a homeowners meeting tomorrow night in Hunter's Mill in our park. And I invite you to come, come up to that and brief us in Hunter's Mill subdivision. What, what are the details about connecting to Hunter's Mill? So. Like I said, I, I like the trails. I'm in favor of, of expanding the trails, but uh, you know, come to, come to a happy medium where we can keep uh, McAllister Park uh, looking nice, keep our nature out in McAllister Park, and also stay out of the neighborhoods that are adjacent to McAllister Park, especially uh, where it comes to Hunter's Mill. Thank you. Ray Knox? I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. It was Ross. The question that you asked about the connection of Hunter's Mill? Yeah, and, and like I said, I'd like to invite you to our homeowners meeting tomorrow and explain a little bit more about this connectivity at Hunter's Mill. Okay. And that's, that would be my question. And, and then also, why are we veering off and going through neighborhoods that are adjacent to McAllister Park? So I'll, I'll address that real quickly. The only connection that's shown here is to Hunter's Mill. Now, I, I've only spoken with the homeowners association uh, leaders that, that I've spoken with, two of them, and they both thought it was a great idea. Now, I don't know if that means that they individually think it's a great idea or if they have actually polled and like talked to people about it, but I'm happy to, to, to come to your neighborhood association meeting. I won't be able to come to you tomorrow night. If y'all have it once a month or something, I'd be happy to come to the next one. Um, but that's I'll, I'll just what happened. with our homeowners association, but like I said, we already get too many people coming yeah. from outside our neighborhood to go to that park. And then if there's talk about making some type of access at that Hunter's Mill Park. I understand. I'm opposed to it. Okay, so before you leave, if you want to come and give me your phone number or some kind of contact information so that I'm making sure that 
I'm getting in touch with you about when the next meeting will be. That okay. way, I'm not getting I'm not getting false information from somebody else. Ray Knox. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilman Perry. I just want to let you know I'll be there at Hunter's Mill tomorrow evening. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Good evening, I'm Ray Knox, a park and trail enthusiast and served as president of Prince of McAllister Park from 2003 to 2011. A little history, back in 2007 when I was president, we submitted to the city as a bond project a trail loop through the same portion of Mud Creek that we're showing today. Unfortunately, it was superseded by the construction of Turkey Creek Pavilion and Playground and also the new entrance off Brisbane Park. Now a little bit about the Howard Creek Park Greenway Trail System has been one of the most ambitious and successful projects undertaken to date by the Parks and Recreation Department, and subsequently one of the best the City of San Antonio has created for its citizens. A visit to any leg of the trails will show an effort appreciative of public enjoying a nice walk, run, skate, or bike by the hundreds. The plan is to eventually connect the city parks and adjoining neighborhoods by an eco-friendly and natural avenue for transportation. That is no cars, which you talk about environment, there you go. The proposed trail will connect dozens of households and their hundreds of citizens to the Greenway, give access to one of San Antonio's largest parks, which is a regional park, and connect the, to the, the Greenway Trail that already located on the southern end of McAllister Park. There's already one there. The designs for the Greenway Trails are environmentally conscious with emphasis on mineral disturbance and a best fit for each natural area. Construction techniques are very progressive, improved to reduce or impede erosion within the floodplains. This is very important because the Mud Creek area is prone to flooding whenever there's a decent rain. And the crisscross of the many man-made trails within it likewise cause extensive erosion. The trail in its surrounding area will benefit from regular maintenance by Parks and Rec, and the adjacent houses will profit from the safety of the steady patrol by park police and trail stewards. The Greenway Trail will provide a wonderful, popular existence and asset for the public and park users, and emphasis on public. Kelly Bender. Hi, my name's Carrie. I'm a cool horn is my last name. Um, and I thank you again for Parks for putting all the hard work and serving the community. I think that your work is, is always appreciated. Thank you for that. Um, I'm coming here today wearing many different hats. Um, first and foremost, uh, I was born and raised in District 10. Uh, I frequent McAllister Park. I'm a mountain biker. I'm a mom who takes her kid on a stroller. We frequent the uh, playground. Um, according to Strava, I am a local legend for my mountain bike. <laughs> I, what I think that means is that I'm there too much. But I enjoy the, the, the trails, I enjoy Mud Creek, I enjoy the access that I have, but um, my access is a privilege um, that some others don't have. And what I also am, I used to work for Wonder Warrior Project, and I used to facilitate adaptive cycling events. So. Morally, what I'm telling myself is, do I want veterans who are bound to hand cycles and recumbents to see Mud Creek? It's not just recreation, it's therapy for them. And we live in a military USA. And I think that's something we need to consider. As much as I love my single track trails, this Mud Creek project is going to provide access to more natural surface trails. It's going to provide more opportunity for conservation by the city and by the county. This is not just for me. And I grew up loving this place more than anything. But what I have to let go is the fact that this is not my park. This is the city's park. And if we want to advocate for all San Antonians to have access to public parks, then we need to allow everybody to access these parks. And that includes people like Trent. 
and people like the veterans that we owe so much to in this city. Thank you for your time. Howdy folks, I'm Allison Cohen, um, District 10 resident, born and raised. I live right next to McAllister Park, and I also sit on the Parks and Recreation Board. I'm the Vice Chair. I've been on it for about six years now. Thank you very much, Councilman Gallagher, for appointing me to that. Um, this has been a very difficult thing for uh, me to weigh, um, not only as a member of the Parks Board, as a citizen, as a neighbor of McAllister Park, a trail user. And um, I want to thank the Parks and Recreation Department. I want to thank Greg Ross, I want to thank Homer Garcia um, for all that they have done to get out this information, to have us here this evening, and for the promotion that they do for our city and for our parks and for these amenities that we can have here at District 10 that we call our home. Um, I am in support of the proposed um, route, and I'm very proud to say that it would be amazing if we can connect it further. And in the meantime, while we're waiting for this trail to take place, as you recall from um, Brandon's presentation, it's not going to start until 2026. I feel that in that amount of time, we can work with parks and District 10 to find other ways to reclaim and improve what's going on there in McAllister the Park. We can find ways to improve the erosion issues, the native plants that are needed, and we can still have this successful route. So thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you everyone here for attending and being involved in your city. That's exactly what we need here at District 10. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Como. I live in Morning Glen neighborhood. We have 30 residences back up to, to Mud Creek. And I, too, love the park system. I've enjoyed the trails, both the concrete trails and the regular trails. And I'm glad that the city is looking at trying to keep the trails a natural substance, but I also understand how, for example, in Hartburger Park, how many of the trails have had erosion with rain. Uh, but I also respect the fact that we need to make sure our trails are as far away from residences as possible. For example, on Volca Ranch, when you pass Volca Ranch area in Hardberger, sometimes you're right up next to somebody's fence. So I certainly respect that privacy. I do think there's a trade-off. If the city can develop and try to use as natural resources, as many natural resources as possible, try to work with natural plants and help the environment, get rid of invasive plants and uh, really try to preserve the area, stop erosion, that's extremely helpful. And the trade-off there, too, is that we do make it a safer place. We get rid of the kids that are back in the back drinking beer, which I know I think of a lot of litter back there. It takes care of a lot of the overgrowth, which already we have bikers trying to get through when the trails are just a real rough dirt area. And we have motorized vehicles. That's not good for erosion. So if we can get rid of some of those things and try to help the, the natural plants, that's really great. So I have a couple of questions. Where is the trail head going to be? I would think off of Thousand Oaks, somewhere or not in the middle of a neighborhood like yours. Uh, or what are we gonna do to protect the animals? And what about historic artifacts? There are some really old artifacts we're found in Mud Creek. Um, and the Fall Creek name on your map right before you did the testimonials is in, actually in the wrong place, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> and uh, like I said before, already we have people trying to transgress the unincorporated area of my creek and making a mess, so thank you. I'll just try to very quickly um, address the, um, the only connection, we're not, we're not gonna have any kind of parking area or anything like that on Thousand Oaks. It's just going to be a connection, uh, possibly to Hunter's Mill, possibly not, if, if there's not support for that. And then a connection to the sidewalk there at Thousand Oaks. The main trailhead would be there upon Bulgari Road. That was one, I can't remember if there was another question that was specific. Animals and 
Historic artifacts. Historic artifacts, thank you. Yeah, we did an archaeological survey, uh, and we did find some things that were precious artifacts that, that however, though, we did make an adjustment to the trail, and I, I'm not going to be able to give you the details on this, except that we're not going to impact any um, historical art artifacts in the proposed Greenway Trail. Um, okay, the next person is uh, Tammy Winthop. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paparelli, Victoria, John, and John. I would first like to say thank you for this meeting. We are all here together listening to each other, and I think that's great. Um, the second thing is that I would like to suggest a material that's different from concrete. Some of you may be aware of it. Um, it's called FlexiPave. It's made of recycled truck tires and urethane and stone. And what, what it does, for one thing, is it keeps the tires out of the landfills where it rises to the top and grows mosquitoes. But the other thing it does is it makes a surface that is softer than concrete that can be just about any color. So it can look like dirt or like cedar or whatever. It's not hot at the hottest time of day, even with the dark colors. You can stand on it barefoot by putting it out in the sun, um, which I can't. I can cook eggs on my girl way. Um, but um, it's used in Arlington National Cemetery. It's used in um, Yellowstone National Park, where they've had problems. It's um, now, my brain's getting older, but there's a town in Florida that has lots of tourist traffic, and they keep track of which surfaces they had tripping suits on. For 10 years, they've had a section of FlexiPave without a single lawsuit. It is ADA compliant as well. And the reason I know about it is that we had a sidewalk put on our street that dug up the roots of my 50-foot oak and I was allowed to pay to put in some flexi pave, so it's been there since 2014, and people use it every day. So it's held up really well. It's not cement, which I like, because it means we didn't dig up more of the aquifer to make it, and that's an issue with me, too. What is the name of it again? Flexi pave. It's KBI Industries, and I do not work for one. <laughs> and it does cost more than some money. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you. So um, we we want to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Uh, I'm going to be hanging out. Uh, I'm just going to use mask on. Those are my glasses. I'm going to be hanging outside with Brandon. We're going to be here a little bit in the event there are any other questions or things that we can help provide information to. Uh, we did go a little bit over our original plan time, and I think it was well worth it to make sure that we captured all of the input as we move forward uh, beyond tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming out, and I see Councilman's coming out and ask if he has any parting words for the group. Thank you, Homer, and thank you, Brandon. Uh, never give a microphone to a politician, right? But uh, no, thank you all, all for coming out here tonight. And thank you for the questions, the comments. Uh, they're going to take all this stuff back and synthesize it and come up with what they're, what they're recommending to do, do with Mud Creek. Um, there's a, a couple of things that bother me a little bit. Um, one was replacing our natural trails with concrete. 
We're not taking away any natural trail trails. We may be intersecting some, but we're not taking away any natural trails. This is in addition uh, with this particular trail. So that, yeah, I want to make sure everybody understands that. We're not taking away any natural surfaces out there. It's only for an addition to that. So the other comment, Laura, I love you. We've known each other for a long time. But when we made that trip through that whole creek line, I said we would take a look at the alternative uh, route. But I did not say that we would use, definitely use that alternative route. I said we'd take a look at it. So I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that I did not say that we will not use Mud Creek in the creek way. So uh, with that, I'm not going to hold y'all anymore. Uh, Homer, you're y'all are staying here for a little bit longer. Uh, but yes, thank y'all so much for coming out tonight. I really do appreciate it.